Something is in the air. The familiar scent of hypocrisy is wafting over the Capitol as unity dissolves into division. We look at why a politically progressive school district has been taking money from the NRA. Opponents of a Denver Olympics launch their campaign with a ringing no. The tale of the final front range sweet corn farmer. And we revisit the father and son whose story moved so many of you last night. His health has landed them back in the hospital, but still sharing their good news on next. A week ago tonight, we sat here and talked about progress above partisanship, about Democrats and Republicans coming together to expel a state legislator accused of serial sexual harassment. Tonight, all that has evaporated as they fight over who should fill that seat. Colorado Republicans are lecturing Democrats while those same Republicans are protecting GOP senators accused of harassment. Colorado Democrats are lecturing Republicans while they conveniently, conveniently remain silent about key Democrats accused of misconduct. Together, they took a stand. Divided, they squabble over a seat. Here's Marshall Zellinger. Because he was a Republican at the time of expulsion, and you, <laughs> there's no mention of how long he had to be a Republican, but he was a Republican, so we do have the authority to appoint. State GOP Chairman Jeff Hayes announced today that Republicans will pick the replacement for Steve Lepsock's empty house seat. He flipped from a Democrat to a Republican one hour before getting ousted last Friday. Colorado's Constitution states the person appointed to fill the vacancy shall be a member of the same political party. Colorado state statute references a lawmaker's death or resignation, but doesn't talk about what to do if the lawmaker is expelled like Lebsock. Had the GOP done nothing, the governor would have been given the power to appoint the next lawmaker. There was some thought that we could be more magnanimous. My personal opinion, I thought it was a little bit phony. The Democrats could take this issue to court. They haven't said they won't, but read between the lines of this statement. There's no legal doubt that Steve Lebsock was a Republican when he was expelled for sexual harassment. This is House District 34 in Thornton. In 2016, Steve Lebsock beat Republican Dustin Johnson 50% to 43%. Before that election, State Representative Faith Winter went to House Democratic leadership and privately complained about Lebsock sexually harassing her. She did not file a formal complaint because she was satisfied with the mediation, but came forward in November when she found out others said they were sexually harassed too. Hayes believes Lebsock never would have won that re-election without what he's calling a cover-up. When we talk about the cover-up, it's not that Faith Winter's name was not mentioned as being the accuser. It's that there was no mention of anybody accusing. Speaking of no mention, I asked Hayes about what's happening with Senate Republicans and sexual harassment claims there and the stance from the leadership from the Republican Party in the Senate that the investigations and results should be kept confidential. He told me he thinks the Senate Republican request that the Denver DA investigate these claims is satisfactory and that the House hasn't done that. But it's one of those, what are you saying about a cover-up when the Senate Republicans are saying we shouldn't be telling anybody it should be confidential? Each side of the legislature gets to make their own rules about who they expel and why, but the Senate Republicans have decided to set a much higher bar to keep their guys in. And Jeff Hayes wanted to remind voters that you can always recall your representative. That is true as well. All right, voters always have that option. Marshall, thank you. So we got our first up-close look behind the fire line at 18th and Emerson today. A look at the melted cars and the condos under construction that have been reduced to a blackened pile. Two people died in that fire. The cause is still under investigation. The city says that work site passed every possible safety inspection before the fire. We've learned Denver Public Schools will stop accepting money from the NRA, which led us to ask, who knew the NRA was giving money to Denver Public Schools? The NRA Foundation hands out a lot of donations and grants, $63 million to nonprofits and government organizations from 2010 to 2016. $7.3 million of that went to schools, including four junior ROTC programs in Colorado. The programs at George Washington and Thomas Jefferson in Denver, along with groups in Fountain and Montrose. DPS now says it will not accept the NRA's equipment donations for this school year. Marjorie Stoneham Douglas High School, the site of the shooting in Florida, made a similar decision recently. The $16,000 in NRA money accepted by DPS is really small change compared to the NRA Foundation's biggest project in Colorado. That's the Independence Institute. The free market think tank does a lot of pro-Second Amendment work and told us today 
No one should be surprised that the NRA gave them $900,000, a third of its Colorado donations. Ever Vias was allowed to walk out of Denver's jail to escape immigration agents, but he could not escape justice for the murder of Tim Cruz last year at an RTD station. Baez was sentenced today to aggravated robbery and accessory to murder. 29 years in prison. Nathan Valdez pleaded guilty to pulling the trigger. He'll serve 58 years. Baez, whose case highlighted the ongoing struggle between Denver and the federal immigration system, he's going to be deported when he gets out of prison. As we've been telling you, the group opposed to a Denver Olympic bid formally kicked off its anti-Olympic campaign today. The No Olympics co-chair is former Governor Dick Lamb. But he wants a new generation of activists to carry the torch. Terrible Olympic pun, I know. He's concerned again about the cost and environmental damage that he believes the Olympics would bring to Colorado. Developer and community leader Kyle Zeppelin is also fronting this effort. About 40 years ahead of we haven't done a great job managing growth up to this point. Um, haven't been able to come close to the need to, for, to address affordable housing. Um, there's a variety of issues for um, urban sprawl, um, how, how we're doing, ma managing the situation right now. So you're basically lighting the fire under the economy in the ways that it's already overheated with these big mega projects. Well, support or oppose the Olympics, you got to admit that logo is pretty hot. There's a debate tomorrow on the benefits and risks of bringing the games to Denver. Our Sonia Gutierrez will have coverage of that discussion on 9 News tomorrow evening. You filled up our inbox last night with notes about Sabian Holiday. The young man we profiled here last night, the teenager, who, along with his dad, created a rec center for people like him with disabilities. What we did not have the family's permission to share last night is that Sabe is currently in the hospital. We went to go see them today. The last 24 hours has been very exciting for my son, his mom, uh, my daughter, my mother. We've been on news. Things have been very exciting. And it's really cool to see myself on TV and to see that so many people are excited for our recreation center to be open. We are at Children's Hospital. Um, it's been a week since we've been here. My son has had some trials and tribulations, which he is managing real well. Things have been going good up until a week ago. I ran into a really hard time with my health and found it really hard to stay positive. However, thanks to family and friends, it's been easy to stay positive. It means a lot to me that through my positivity, it's spread throughout the world and has given a lot of people hope to live. And it's nice to see that people look up to me. <laughs> Sabe and Keithan didn't share their story with us in an appeal for funding. However, a ton of you have asked us how you can help their cause financially. They're still raising money for that rec center to build it out with more equipment. And you can find a link to that effort on Next Facebook page. The last sweet corn farmer on the front range cashes out of the crop. He blames development. Even the cool coming weekend can't save Next's favorite ice rink. Davey the baby's back, the rock climbing toddler we named the most Colorado thing we saw today. It's very Colorado for sure. And Dr. Max tells Steve all the things you can get away with if you only convince people you're competent. Next. A well-known farmer in Brighton says Denver's growth in part is forcing him to shut down his sweet corn crop. Robert Sakata from Sakata Farms says it simply costs too much to harvest sweet corn anymore. He's long paid for housing for his seasonal workers and with Denver's development and growth, Sakata ran out of affordable housing options. Where there was once nothing but open space and farmland around his, he now says he's surrounded. There's Walmart and King Supers on that side and kind of surrounded now. 
Sakata says he'll shift his focus to crops that he says are cheaper to grow and easier to harvest, things like pinto beans, onions, and grain corn. A sign of the changing seasons is melting in the backyard of our next colleague photojournalist, Tom Cole. We showed you when Tom filled up his ice rink for the winter. It's a great spot for him and his boys to play. And they skated before they went to school Wednesday morning. Today, the ice rink really is not so much of an ice rink anymore. It's basically just puddles and slush. Tom says it's time to come to grips with it. It's done for the year. I'm meteorologist Kathy Saban. I hope you had a great week. We're looking at a weekend with a changing weather pattern as a storm system moves toward western Colorado tonight. Our high above the average of 53 in the mid 60s. Some areas reported 70 today in southern Colorado was still close to 60 out at the airport, but it's dry, it's windy. There's a cold front approaching from the west and some of the higher gusts over some of those higher passes now exceeding 40, even 50 miles per hour. The red flag warnings for high fire danger have been taken down, but as the system literally blows across the state tomorrow, the winds will increase again. The moisture is really limited with this system, so we just have isolated rain and snow showers in for Denver. After overnight lows in the mid-30s will be seasonal tomorrow, low 50s. I think Sunday will be the drier, calmer day. Low 60s possible early next week, back to the 70s on Wednesday. Again, a reminder, this is our snowiest month on average. Daylight saving time this weekend. Don't forget to set those clocks ahead one hour, and it is beautiful up in the high country. They love a little snow, and a lot of people heading up there to get into what could be one to four inches of new snow tonight. All right, Dr. Max Wachtel is here, and again, we are talking about some very strange personality quirks. Oh, my goodness. The, the <laughs> what just happened there? I, it's what happens when I look at you and I don't look forward. It's the yes, the, the what you just did was a pratfall, right? The, the you ran into a door. Uh, now, the, <laughs> there's an interesting study that looks at that. It's actually they actually call it the pratfall effect, where uh, the people who are seen as very competent and very capable, like me, obviously, uh, when they make a mistake, uh, other people tend to like them a whole lot more. Uh, people who are not so capable, not so competent, when they make a mistake, they're less likable so now should we pull folks at yeah, home? I, am, I, I, am I more likable or less likable than I just was yeah and, uh, and and I don't know what the study says about the person who laughs at the, at the individual who runs <laughs> into the door uh, that probably makes him less likable. so you're saying don't make mistakes if you aren't seen as confident and competent that's that's right if you are not competent don't make a mistake. But if you are competent, then you're fine. You yeah. can make as many mistakes as you Make as many as you want, yeah. and people will love you for it. I like it. Dr. Max Wachtel, thank you. I'm going to go see if the first aid <laughs> kit's around here somewhere. <laughs> Pop quiz. Is this a dog violating Denver's brewery ban? Or a dog enjoying life in a different Colorado city where health regulators focus on actual issues? We meet the parents of Colorado's rock climbing baby to talk about life choices. For his age. <laughs> and without really thinking about it, he has good form, staying close to the wall. And special guests close out our week as we share your good news. Next. Colorado thing we saw today is a canine refugee who escaped Denver's ban on dogs and breweries and found a company bar stool at Joyride Brewing in Edgewater, where apparently the health department has more important priorities. Perhaps you remember when Denver announced its crackdown on dogs and breweries, we used open records law to gauge the actual extent of the epidemic. There had been one substantiated complaint. The outdoorsiest among us in Colorado can make everybody else feel a bit inadequate. There's always someone who's climbed more 14ers, ran more marathons, and skied off taller cliffs. Our Ann Herbst met a baby from Bailey who's on his way to putting every adventurous Colorado to shame. Yeah, he's got mud on his face, huh? Little Davey has mommy's smile. He does the nose scrunch, which I do a lot. Grandma's <laughs> love of reading. Her love of books. I think. Grandpa's knack for swimming, too. You splish splash? Yeah. Yeah. Even though this 20-month-old uh, uh, uh. 
shares all these things in common with them. <laughs> Signature move, isn't it? His mom, Justine, says it's his dad, David. Nice shot, whoa! Who he resembles yes. most. He is even named after dad. Yeah, everything is fascinating to him, especially stuff that dad loves. And Davy's dad, Woo, I gotcha. loves climbing. So much so, he built a climbing wall in their house. It just fits perfectly with the loft, and Justine was down for it, so. <laughs> There's only one natural next step for a kid who watches his dad's every move. Drum roll, please. I'm proud of him, everything he does. He can't even climb stairs yet. But he took to the kid's size climbing wall like a champ. Just living out those passions to see what he does, who he becomes. He's out of this world. Davey might be following in his father's footholds, oh, yeah. but he's got both his mom and dad's hearts. <laughs> now you're strong like daddy, huh? Just the heart that Justine has. Whoa. Can you get the bell? And the support that I want to give our son. We want to make those dreams come true. For next, this is Ann Herbst. Get that bell. Yeah. <laughs> Don't freak out. Davy's parents are always there. They're watching him, making sure he's safe. They say his next adventure is going to be kayaking. Something tells me that we are still going to get concerned emails from some of you anyway, perhaps from that same lady who wrote in and said that when I grew a beard, that my newborn daughter would not recognize me for the rest of her life. It's all going to be okay. Quick guy. check back with Angelina <laughs> Actis. She's the eighth grader who we named last night's smartest kid in Colorado. An eighth grader who's auditing a college class at DU. Her college team competed last night. They pitched their idea for a travel app to investors. Her team came in fourth. Winning idea was from another DU team, an app to help people figure out which items can be recycled. It is Friday, so it means that we wrap up the week with your good news and your words of encouragement for a newfound friend of this program. It's Friday. Spent a lot of time this week talking about a terrible fire, scandal involving the mayor, fight over the Olympics. Let's let the last word be your good news. The feeling in the city today, you can feel all the positive vibes. My good news is Junkyard Jam. So something exploded in my car. It's getting towed, um, but the good news is my birthday's on Monday, and I'm going to get some money to pay for whatever broke. <laughs> I got the cheesy smile, too. Our good news is we made it to Denver for Colorado Crossroads. Yeah! I actually am becoming an uncle. My good news is that I get to see downtown. My good, my good news, news is we're getting married. <laughs> it's beautiful out here. You know, I usually come out here, you know, just to make people feel good, man. You know, playing these beautiful rhythms, seeing the people dancing and smiling and enjoying themselves. That's my good news. Hey, it's payday. The good news is that we have now raised enough fund to purchase uh, some of our equipment for the recreation center that is total accessible for wheelchair and able-bodied individuals. Thank you. I've encountered possibly one of the hardest challenges in my life and have managed to stay positive. So many of you have written in with your encouragement for the Holiday family. Cassidy Miller commented on our YouTube channel. I went to middle school with Sabian. He is truly an inspiration. I am glad he has kept a positive mindset throughout his path in life. And Jay on Twitter speaks for all of us. He wrote in simply, fight on, Sabe. We'll see you next time.